So another book that I wanted to tell you guys about is one that I actually finished reading today, about half an hour ago. And this one is all about synesthesia, uh, which I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. So this book is called The Man Who Tasted Shapes. A bizarre medical mystery offers revolutionary insights into emotions, reasoning, and consciousness by Richard E. Seidewick, M.D. And... Looking for the page. It was published in 1993. So it's actually pretty recent, which is really surprising to me because of what he talks about in it. So first, let me just explain with what synesthesia is. I believe that I'm saying it right, but if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. So synesthesia is um, kind of a disorder because it's not the same as everyone else, but I don't think you necessarily need to call it that. It's um, a, basically a medical event. I, I don't know what the word I should be using right now is, but it's when a person um, has some senses that run together. Senses being the concepts of sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. The five senses that you kind of learn about in elementary school. But what happens to the people when they have synesthesia is that when they experience one sense, they sometimes experience other senses at the same time relating to that sense. So for instance, I'm going to use the, the people that were talked about in this book as an example. Uh, one of the people who are real people that are talked about in this book, um, when he tastes food, he tastes the flavor, but he also feels on his hands the geometric shape of the flavor. So, in the first chapter, he talks about how his chicken does not have enough points. When he tastes it, he's like, this is too round. It needs to have points. And it's not like when some people are tasting wine and they say, oh, well, this one has a full body rounded flavor because that's a metaphor. They're, they're saying it in a symbolic way. This person actually experiences the sensation of touching the geometric shape of the flavor of his food. The most common way that synesthesia manifests itself is in um, seeing sounds or what they call colored hearing. So one person said that when they heard the sound of a trumpet, it came out scarlet. Like they saw the color scarlet when they heard the sound of a trumpet. Another person said that uh, when she heard someone's beeper go off, it was like a very high-pitched sound, she saw red, three red lightning bolts. Um, and for each person who has synesthesia, the experience is different. So even if two people have colored hearing, they won't necessarily see the same colors when they hear the same things. Uh, and different artists have tried to replicate what this looks like. Some artists that actually have synesthesia have done, tried to replicate it in paintings. And, uh, and some people have actually written colored symphonies where they ha incorporated light that they wanted to have played or light displayed, light, colors of light displayed at certain moments when certain notes were played. Um, and then also people were trying to paint images that gave you the feeling that they felt when they experienced an experience instead of just painting the experience, which I think is super interesting. Um, I do like to do art, but I have not gotten past representational yet. So like, like you know, animated realism. I guess it's not even realism because it's just animation but like like that's what I draw anyhow that's not what the book is about so this doctor was realizing that a lot of patients who were seeing doctors at the time that he was practicing uh, were having complaints that were not related to their physical 
thing. So when someone would go to see an ophthalmologist, they might be like, hey, I see this thing. The ophthalmologist would look at their eyes and be like, well, it's not an object in your eyes, so you're probably fine. Whereas the thing they were seeing might have been not a physical object in their eye, but something that they were seeing because of something going on in their brain. It could have been a hallucination, but it could have been a lot of other things. Uh, and there are a lot of different things that your brain does that are super weird and also super cool. And uh, an instance that this man was talking about is that I think it was like the secretary of a president. Somebody who was famous, but I don't know who they were because I wasn't born at the time that this happened, got shot in an attempt to assassinate uh, President Reagan. The, they were not trying to assassinate President Reagan, in, but someone else was, and they got shot instead. And they were able to recover, but the bullet went through a certain part of their brain that activated a disorder in which I don't remember what the name of it is at this moment, but it means that they literally cannot control the impulse to tell jokes at all times. So... Any time an opportunity for a joke or a pun arises, they, like, have to do it. They can't stop themselves. Um, that's that's what I understood it to be from what I read from this book. I, I could be wrong because the book wasn't about that. But it just is so super interesting. And so this doctor just, um, was talking about his experience in the medical field and how people were relying on machines to do their diagnostics and testing and not really talking to the patients and he's found that in his practice it works a lot better to spend a lot of time talking to the patients and figuring out and diagnosing them from what you hear and from their story and only running tests if you need to clarify more information or to check to make sure that there isn't something else happening that you can't know just from knowing it. And obviously, medicine is a super difficult, complicated practice. I'm not trying to tell doctors what to do or anything like that. I'm just telling you what this doctor said about his experience um, and what he saw happening with patients. Um, and so to kind of illustrate what was going on with that, and also just because he was interested in it, he found a few people that had synesthesia and decided to do some experiments and they obviously gave their consent, and they weren't super invasive experiments, at least not the beginning ones. Basically, he just did a few control tests to kind of see how their synesthesia worked for them, and then compared it to uh, a bunch of people who did not have synesthesia. They had them take the same tests. So for the man who could take shapes, he... Uh, was given a set of 10 flavors that he was um, given in a different kinds of orders about a hundred times and then he was given a chart and he had to circle what shape he felt the flavor to be and the chart was uh, tailored to um, what the sort of shapes that he specifically would feel because there were some shapes that it seemed like he didn't really feel much um, and uh, also he was the, the doctor had worked with him unclinically for a little while also. And then the woman who could had colored hearing, they made a, a set of piano notes for her on a tape. And she, she wrote down the name of the color that she saw. And then they had a control group of people who did not have synesthesia taste and or listen to the different stimuli and then have their own circles and what then they were able to prove from that is that synesthesia is a thing that exists basically that people who don't have it can't reproduce the effects of it because it's a unique to one person thing and in and things that they experience stay the same so at, at one point they hear the the note a it will stay the same color no matter when they hear it whereas someone else might hear the note a one time and decide that it sounded green then 
and then a week later hear the note A and decide that it sounds yellow because they're just guessing. They don't actually have synesthesia. And, um, I mean, I cannot say everything that this man wrote because <laughs> it's very detailed and in-depth and, uh, according to him, he's one of the first people in, like, the modern, he wrote it in 19, it was published in 1990s, so one of the first people in this era of time to actually do research on synesthesia, write about it, and study it. And before that, there really wasn't a lot of concrete, cohesive writing about it because they, um, some people did studies that didn't actually involve people who had synesthesia, but they were still studying it, and it didn't work out quite the way that it wasn't as helpful. Later on, he did a slightly more invasive procedure that involved having, still, still with his subject's consent, that involved having the man who could taste shapes uh, wear a certain kind of helmet that was able to read the uh, blood in his, his cerebral cortex. Um, and he had to breathe some axon gas to have that happen, but he was okay because it was part of the experiment. There were doctors there, it was controlled. And it was able to show where the blood flow in his brain was when he was experiencing synesthesia. And for most people who did this procedure, they did a control where the blood flow was just pretty general. And then they did different things and the blood flow would usually increase in certain areas. But when they, had, when they did it with him, the blood flow actually decreased in a lot of areas instead of increasing. Um, which showed them that instead of this thing being something that was experienced in the cerebral cortex, it was actually experienced in the lower part of the brain, uh, which they discovered was the limbic system, because the blood was going to the limbic system instead of being in the cerebral cortex. Um, definitely I recommend that you read this book to get a better understanding of what I'm trying to explain as a not-doctor, but... I found this super interesting and I'm kind of surprised that that this was something that he did all this research and it was like the first time it was done and it was only like 30 years ago, which is like pretty recent, but people have been having these experiences since, like the first recorded one was I think in like the 1700s, maybe the 1600s, but I'm assuming that they could have happened, like, as far back as people being able to express what they were feeling happened. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to read to you the inside cover, and then I really hope that you guys go and check this book out for yourselves. Imagine a world of salty visions, purple odors, square tastes, and green wavy symphonies. Although only 10 people in a million experience the, it, the world in this manner, the result of a condition called synesthesia, neurologist Richard Seidewick believes that by understanding the workings of this condition, we can gain surprising insights into how all human minds function. Synesthesia has confounded scientists for more than 200 years. In 1979, Dr. Seidewick met a man who literally tasted shapes. Soon after, he met a woman who heard and smelled colors. He tells the captivating stories of these extraordinary individuals and relates how his unique experiments with 40 other synesthetes over the course of a decade led him to conclude that we all have the amazing ability to perceive the world synesthetically, but this ability remains hidden from our conscious awareness. Seidewick compels us to re-examine our beliefs about the nature of consciousness and what it means to be human. He convincingly demonstrates that humans are irrational by design. Our emotion, not our logic, is really in charge. His investigations deliver a fresh perspective on the nature of memory, the roots of creativity, the feasibility of artificial intelligence, and the importance of subjectivity in medical research. The man who tasted shapes brings us the solution to a bizarre medical mystery and leads us to a new understanding of the human mind that turns all our conventional notions about reason and emotion inside out. 
Richard E. Seidewick, M.D., is a neurologist in Washington, D.C. He is the author of three neurology textbooks, and interviews with him and articles about his work have appeared in national and international media. For more about Dr. Seidewick, see the last page of the book, which um, I can also read to you right now. Doopy doo. Just turning pages. I guess I'll read you the about the author section, because why not? Richard Edmund Seidewick, MD, has authored both neurology test textbooks and popular works. He was nominated for the 1982 Pulitzer Prize for his New York Times magazine cover story about the condition of White House Press Secretary James Brady, who received a gunshot wound to the brain during the attempted assassination of President Ronald Reagan. That's the guy I was talking to you about earlier who had the um, uh, impulses that were really hard to resist, or maybe impossible, I don't completely remember, of humor and puns. After this, Dr. Seidewick has appeared on often on national and international radio and television, including All Things Considered, Voice of America, and Good Morning America. His work has been reported in national publications such as U.S. News and World Report, The Washington Post, and The Los Angeles Times. Dr. Seidewick received his B.A. in chemistry from Duke University and his M.D. from the Bowman Gray School of Medicine of Wake Forest University. The New Jersey native studied at the University of London's National Hospital for Nervous Diseases, trained in ophthalmology and neuropsychology, and later served as chief resident in neurology at George Washington University before entering private practice. He lives in Washington, D.C. The son of a physician and an artist, he has long been interested in the harmony between science and art. His medical biographies of Chekhov and Ravel have won awards. He has several times been a resident fellow at the Hambridge Center and the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, both Southern artists' colonies. Dr. Seidewick has been an invited speaker at the World Congress of Neurology, the National Science Foundation, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is listed in Who's Who in America and Who's Who in the World, serves on the editorial boards of the journals Brain and Language and Brain and Cognition, and is a fellow of Britain's Royal Society of Physicians. So if you guys are bored, like I said earlier, please go to the library or online and check out cool books and learn new stuff because this is a great opportunity and I highly recommend it. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day and please continue to do so.